I was governor of Maine from uh, 1995 to 2003. Uh, it's hard to explain governor to a place that doesn't have states, uh, but it's like prime minister. Uh, Maine is a small state, 1.3 million people. Very large, though, very spread out. Uh, our largest city is Portland with maybe 100,000 people, 200,000 people in the metropolitan area, but a very rural state. About 210,000 students, K through 12, um, and mostly, almost entirely public schools. We have some private schools, some parochial, some Catholic schools, but almost all uh, public schools, 90 plus percent. Uh, so what I want to talk about with you today and share with you is our one-to-one uh, -one learning project. And before we talk about the specifics of the project, uh, I want to tell you why we did it and also how we did it what we've learned, and how it's working. So that's what we'll talk about. And the first question is why. Uh, as I was uh, uh, working as governor, I ended up having three insights, a data point, and a lunch. Okay. The data point is that Maine when I was governor, was 37th in the United States in per capita income, 37, the top of the bottom third, okay, and had been that way except for a short period in the 1980s for 100 years. In other words, a relatively low income state. I wanted to do something about that. That was the data point. The first insight was that as I looked out into the future, 5, 10, 20 years, to think about our economy and what our young people would do as jobs, I couldn't figure it out. I could not predict. Things which I would have predicted would be good jobs 10 or 20 years from now may be going away. For example, when I was governor in the early 90s, mid-90s, a big growth business in Maine was call centers. You know, taking calls, tech support, call centers. And I thought, this is a good business. These are job, good jobs, and, and it will be a good thing for our economy, and we're good at it. And by the way, it has to stay here because of the language. Well, as we now know, call centers are all over the world, and most of the call centers for the US now are in India. So, so much for that as a guarantee in the future. And when I looked out, I had fear because I didn't know, I didn't know what the future brought. And as I thought about that future, I realized the only things that the only thing that I could predict about the future was that it would involve more education and technology. None of us here know what the jobs in Singapore are going to be in 20 years, but you can practically guarantee that whatever they are will involve more education than today, and the use of technology. So that was insight number one. What are the jobs of the future? We don't know, but education and technology are key. The second insight came from meeting with other governors. Every year, all the governors in the US get together twice a year and have meetings and talk with each other and share ideas. And as I was sitting in one of these meetings in the late 90s, I suddenly sort of sat back and had a, uh, an insight that sort of was, you know, like this. And what it was was we were all chasing the same thing. All the governors wanted their people to have good jobs. Governor of Texas or Tennessee or California, Maine, Massachusetts, all were after the same goal. And we were all chasing it the same way the formula for economic development in the US, and I suspect in other, probably here, lower taxes, streamlined regulation, exports, research and development. Sound familiar? OK. Well, think of yourself now. You're in my shoes. You're the governor of a small state. At the bottom third, the third insight was 
that uh, everything we did in government was incremental. Little things, little steps, little tiny movements, incremental. By the way, I, I was talking with this, talking about this to a group of people from Portugal, honey genius. And he probably knows more about education and computers than anyone in the world. He's about 80 years old. He studied with Piaget in Switzerland and was one of the founders of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Media Lab, the famous MIT Media Lab. And he lives in Maine. And one of the nice things about being a governor is that if you invite someone to lunch, they generally come. <laughs> and someone told me that I should meet this man. So I invited him to lunch, and he came. And we were chatting about computers and education. And I'm very interested in technology. And I said, today in Maine, we have about five students for every computer. What if we got a lot of money and made it three students for every computer. Wouldn't that be terrific? And he said, no. Wouldn't really change that. So I said, what if we, we could have two students for every computer? I thought I was negotiating. And he said, no, it wouldn't make it. And then he sat, he was, I was sitting here, and he was sitting right here, and he said, put his fingers up, he said, it is only when it is one to one that the power occurs. Well, this was 1996 or 1997. We didn't have the money. It was a fantasy. You know, that we could do. It was just no, you know, it was just impossible. But I had that in the back of my head, that idea, one to one. First time I'd heard of that concept. And so, okay, go forward to the winter of 1999. And our budget people called me and said, Governor, guess what? We're going to have a $70 million surplus this year that no one expects. New money. No one knows it's coming. We just want you to know. So I went back and gathered my people together. And I said, I want us to think about how we can use this money to make change that will really benefit the people of our state in the future. We could have spent a little on the roads, a little on the roof of the schools, a little on this or that, and it all would have been gone and no change. So I said, I want to think about how we can use this in some major way. And we talked about buying all new textbooks, for example. I mean, there are all ideas. It could have been used for any purpose, but we decided quickly that it was going to be education. That was, the, that was an easy part of the decision. Um, and then I said, and, and I mentioned, I said, remember Dr. Pappert's one-to-one -one idea? Is there any way we could even think about it? So my young people that worked with me went off and did a lot of thinking. And on the Friday before Christmas, I stuck my head in the door of my chief of staff's office. There was a group of people there. And I said, how's it coming? And one of the young men looked up from his laptop and said, we figured out that if we take 50 million of the surplus and put it into a fund in the bank and raise 15 million privately from philanthropy, from business, and let it sit for two years with interest, we will have a big enough fund that the interest would be enough to buy a laptop for every seventh grader in Maine forever. I said, Wow, that's the idea. That's the idea. So we worked for a month to develop the, the idea. We did a lot of research. We looked. There's there are places all over the world where this is happening in small in, in Australia, for example, places where individual schools, school districts have tried this, and uh, we did a lot of homework and came up with a proposal to do just that, to create the fund, use the interest on the fund to buy a laptop every year. And the idea was to start in seventh grade and phase in to 12. First year seven, then seven and eight, then seven, eight, nine, and all, all the way 